Um, thank you for joining us tonight. Um, if you don't know me already, I'm Sheila, Signet's president and COO. Um, and tonight we're here to talk about an intentional approach to college admissions, uh, which is something that we call our Pathfinder approach. And you're going to hear a lot more about that um, throughout the presentation and later on from two true experts in that approach. Um, and before I introduce them, I want to tell you a little bit about Signet. Um, at Signet, what our mission is, is really to help teenagers find their own path and then support them as they pursue that path or pursue their goals in their life. Um, and today we wanna show you how we do this and the way we think about this um, in the hopes that you and your student can have a more meaningful, less stressful experience navigating high school, the college process and whatever comes after that for them. Um, so with that, I'm going to introduce my two colleagues. First, we have Andrea, our Director of, of Operations at Signet, uh, who also happens to be one of our master coaches uh, working directly with students. And also Allison, our Principal Admissions Consultant, who has nearly two decades of experience in selective college admissions on both sides of the desk, working as a former admissions officer and also as a college counselor in a private school. Um, you're going to hear more from both of them. I'm really going to let them talk about their own expertise, um, and you'll get, of course, a chance to ask them questions later on as well. So um, as we get started, I like to set an agenda. That's just the kind of person I am. So first, we're going to talk about um, why we're talking about this, right? Like, why are we even here? Why do we care about this? So we're going to get on the same page about that. Then we're going to share kind of our secret sauce and some tools to actually get you started taking this more intentional approach. Um, we're going to cover the three phases of the college process, and then we're going to open up for question and answers. So I imagine we'll have about 35 minutes of kind of us talking and providing information, and then the rest of that time should be open for questions if we do this right. Um, and that usually depends on me and how much I ramble. So I'm going to keep it tight, I promise. So first, let's talk about the why. Like, why are we doing this? Why do we care about college admissions? And, you know, a lot of people will say, oh, they just got to get into the best school and that sets them up for everything else. But um, we think that's taking too narrow of a view. It's a little too superficial. We think that this is part of something bigger. Um, we care about college and that whole process because we see it as an integral part of setting our children up for success college, career, life, you know, whatever aspect you want to think about. Um, but if we if we are thinking about college admissions just as, you know, I want them to get in, uh, we're missing the whole point and missing the preparation, right? Um, and so that's, that's why we think, you know, there's a problem with just thinking about this as getting in. Um, and um, we want to take uh, a more holistic approach to helping a student find meaning, um, success, however they define it, you know, joy in their lives. And the thing I want to point out is that these are lifelong pursuits, right? I think everybody in this room is still working towards those things and trying to understand what they mean uh, in their own individual lives. Um, it's a very personal thing. It's different for every, every single individual. And it's also not something someone can just hand you, like this is how you find joy, or this is what success means for you. It's, it's a very reflective process that takes place over um, a number of years, right? Um, and, and the problem, as I see it, is that our society and our educational system really stifles that process of really understanding what success means for each individual student. Um, what happens is we get put onto this sort of conveyor belt of, you know, you go through elementary school, middle school, high school, college, then it's a career and maybe a family in there. And um, we aren't really encouraged to think critically about why are we moving from stage to stage? Why are these stages in this order? Uh, how do I navigate those things, right? Um, we have some ways of thinking about it. Um, you know, you've got a college counselor in your school, um, but that's really, again, just thinking about that surface level, right? So um, students, and I'm gonna change my slide here, students often don't know how to envision their future life 
um, whether that's, you know, college, career, what their family life might look like, where they want to live. Um, it's a problem of how. But also, we're talking about teenagers. So um, if they don't understand why, um, it's also going to be a problem, right? So we've got a how problem and a why problem. Um, Andrea actually gave me this wonderful metaphor um, <laughs> when we were talking about how school, as it's set up right now, just fills their head with content, really important content, you know, math and history and how to think about literature and uh, things like that. But it doesn't tell them or doesn't teach them how to reflect on what's meaningful to them in a personal way. So they know what to do with that content. So if you imagine your child has never seen a jigsaw puzzle before. Um, school is just giving them handful after handful of puzzle pieces, but no box, no you know picture to be aiming for. Um, and the the kids not only do they not know uh, what to do with these pieces, like okay, I got I got all this. Now what? Um, they don't know that they can aim for a picture with all these pieces right, without that idea of a box. Um, so uh, as a parent, you're probably watching us and you're a little worried. Um, are they gonna be able to put this thing together? What are, are they gonna live in my basement for the rest of our, you know, our lives? What's gonna happen? Um, and, you know, as parents who care, our instinct is to help them as much as possible, right? In some cases, do it for them. Give them someone else's picture even to aim for. Um, and uh, the, the problem with that is this is their puzzle. This is their life. And they have to imagine that picture for themselves uh, so that they can put the, the puzzle together. And now I'm a parent myself, and I know this is very scary. It feels kind of too risky to leave it to them to figure out whatever time frame they're going to be able to figure this out. But if we do that thing where we force it, we try to do it for them, we really rob them of an opportunity, an opportunity to embrace their own strengths, to think for themselves, to tap into their own creativity, and truly just grow into the young adult that you, you know, hope that they'll be. Um, and they might get stuck in a box trying to be someone that they're not. Um, and I feel very passionate about this because this was me right? That's me stuck in a box. <laughs> um, you know, my parents had very clear expectations for me. They had sort of mapped out my whole future and I did my best to live up to their expectations. Um, so I, when I went to college, I went to Harvard. I was a pre-med like my dad and my brother. Um, but a few years into college, I finally admitted to myself, this is just not a fit. It's not what I wanted out of my life. Um, but the problem really was that I had no idea what I did want or how to start figuring sure. that out. No, and and a, I was a bit lost for a while. A presentation by Signet about how you can help. Okay. <laughs> um, so um, it, was, it was like a decade and maybe three or four careers later that I started putting this puzzle together for myself. Um, and when I joined Signet, which I think is just the best organization in the world, of course, um, it really changed everything for me. It all just clicked. And all of that other noise of other people's expectations um, and my own insecurities really just faded away because I could truly listen to myself, right? And that's what we're trying to help students do is listen to those voices that tell them, oh, this is actually meaningful for me, or this is fun for me. I can see myself doing this and listen to that voice more than my friend over there is doing that. I should do that thing, right? Um, and I share my own story, not because I think it's unique, but because I know it's just so common. Um, I'm sure every adult in the room has had some version of that story where they, you know, floundered on their path before they found it. Um, and so um, I think this is just, uh, a really great concept for us to be able to share with our kids and share openly, like I share it with all of my students, to let them know it's not going to look like a straight line. That's okay. That's the process. Um, and, and that's really what Pathfinder is meant to help students do, is not take them through this process, but walk with them as they go 
into this process on their own. Um, and, and now I'm going to shut up. I promised I was going to keep it tight. Um, and I'm going to turn this over to Andrea. Andrea, you just tell me when you want me to hit the next slide. But Andrea is going to start telling us about kind of the Pathfinder approach as a whole and the kind of work she does with students as a coach. Fabulous. This is our Thanks. this is the secret sauce part. <laughs> Yeah, yeah I, I like calling it that. I think it's quite true. Um, so for many years, right, Signet has worked with students, guiding them through all their academic um, challenges and journeys with this kind of eye towards the college admissions process. But recently, when we decided, okay, what would happen if we brought all these services together and did it in like a really specific and intentional way? can we create something that's kind of greater than the sum of the parts of all these different things that we know our staff can do? Um, so this program that Sheila knows is called Pathfinder, um, I think is really designed with like a sense of magic in mind. Um, so I'm gonna talk through a little bit of what is included like from a functional perspective, right? But really what makes everything work for us. So if you're, uh, able to look at our screen right now. Um, the graphic up there um, captures all the different things that a student can do through Pathfinder, right? Life coaching, academic planning, um, working on their college application process, all of these wonderful things, right? I find the idea of a student having access to all these resources, like quite compelling and exciting. Um, and it makes me happy to know that Signet has been able to be kind of like a one-stop shop for all of the academic needs of our students and our families. But I know that if I show this to a student or maybe some of you parents, um, you might feel excited, but you also might find this graphic totally overwhelming. <laughs> There's a lot of stuff here. It might feel like a lot of things that have to get done. It might feel confusing because you're looking at this being like, why does a student need life coaching in the ninth grade? Like, it might not make a lot of sense. Um, and, you know, Sheila mentioned this concept of not wanting to put students on a conveyor belt through their lives. We have that perspective in, in the work that we do too, where we don't want to put all of our students through this conveyor belt of services and just expect everything to work, right? Um, they would feel burnt out, pulled in a lot of directions. It just wouldn't hit the way that we want it to. Um, so how do we add true value to a student's life when we're thinking about all the things that we know we could offer or that a student might benefit from? Um, next slide, please, Sheila. Um, so basically our student, our approach does not work without situating our students as the leaders of the process and essentially like the leaders of their own lives, um, which at the age students are in high school is a very powerful thing because a lot of them don't get that much anywhere else. Right. Um, so beyond all the like individual things that we might work on preparing for the SAT, writing an essay, whatever, we're fostering skills that set them up for success um, in all other aspects of life, right? So talk about the secret sauce. I think this is it, right? All of those avenues on the last slide really mean nothing without helping the student find that sense of control in their lives. Um, so our coaches, help our students build this skill by giving them some agency, by um, teaching them how to reflect, um, by really creating a safe space for students to learn about themselves, all the while holding some guardrails and guidance to the things we know that they need to think about at these particular milestones in high school. Um, so our most successful Pathfinder students or students at all at Signet um, are able to set their own goals, understand the steps to get there, and adapt to challenge and failure um, because our coaches are building that skill with them, pointing them in all the right directions. So next slide, please, Sheila. Um, so I believe that students are able to take the lead in this program because they build the skills to reflect on themselves. So just like anything you might do in life, um, 
reflection is a muscle and it takes practice and it takes struggle in order to be good at it, right? You might ask any person on the, the street, right? Questions about their life, their goals, their fears. They might totally draw blanks. They might tell you what they think you want to hear, or they might just kind of parrot off the same answer that they've told a million other people or have heard from others, right? Um, and I think that can lead to a lot of um, what we've called like empty decisions, right? Just following along, going with the flow without developing um, like a deep sense of drive and a deep sense of kind of heart in the things that we choose to do. Um, but it's really hard to do. It's very hard to live actively and deliberately. Um, even as a, an adult, it's even harder when you're kind of a new person developing in the world as a, as a young adult and as a high schooler. Um, and reflection is really the key to making that switch. Um, so we found that we have to build that skill early in a student's career because they have kind of a lower stakes environment to get that practice in freshman year and in sophomore year. So by the time we're kind of turning up heat for college admissions, uh, junior and senior year, um, they are able to kind of meet that higher stakes environment with experience, with background, with an understanding of themselves that's going to kind of pull them through it. Um, so uh, ultimately, I, I see students coming out of the Pathfinder work um, not only with, with prep to make all these big decisions and changes in life, um, but also they're developing a sense of, of values, which to us means like, hey, what's important to you? A sense of vision to say, hey, what's an idea? What could potentially be that picture on the puzzle box? Um, not only for that college process, but that skill set that takes them kind of into the beyond, right? Um, and getting to that point with a student can be and feel a little abstract, but um, I'd like to show maybe a, a couple quick uh, examples of some of the exercises that we do in this coaching process to help them start to build that muscle. Uh, so Sheila, next slide, please. Great. So this is my favorite coaching tool of all time. Uh, this is called the life satisfaction wheel, right? Um, I encourage um, anybody to do this uh, in your adulthood at any point in life. Um, I have come back to this many times myself. Um, but essentially, the idea is to think deeply about all these different aspects that make up our lives and check in with ourselves and, and give a rating on this kind of one to 10 scale of like, how kind of fulfilled am I in this area? How nervous or anxious am I in this area? Um, and then what does that look like visually, right? So the exercise would be identifying that with a student, kind of putting a dot on the scale, coloring it in and seeing, okay, if a full circle is a fully kind of actualized, perfect life with no concerns, nobody's ever gonna get there, but how close are you? How clunky is this wheel if we were to turn it, right? Um, so for students, it, it becomes a really, it takes an abstract concept of like what's going on in your life, breaks it down into a like an easy kind of segmented, se segmented way to think about things um, and creates a place for us to come back to three months from now, six months from now to see, okay, what's changed? Are we getting closer or farther away? Are we having trouble maintaining these certain things? Did a totally new challenge pop up? Um, so by going through this multiple times, it gets easier. The kinds of questioning and reflections get deeper and we're able to see kind of visual change over time. Um, so usually when I, when I see a student for the first time, this might be the first thing that we do together in order to kind of build that foundation, not only of my own understanding of their lives, but um, of their understanding of how they are gonna participate in those conversations. Um, Next slide, please, Sheila. Um, another, what I find quite actually simple exercise to jump starting a student's kind of understanding of themselves is building a list of personal values. Um, the 
what you're seeing on your screen is just kind of sampling of some examples um, that I might pull up and say, here are a bunch of values to a student. I, I've used different kinds of lists depending on, on what we're looking at. Um, but encouraging students to, re to, to read the examples, see what sticks out for them, see what doesn't click for them, and ultimately try on all these different things until they're kind of feeling like they're honing in on, okay, what are the things that are most important for me in my life? And how is that gonna kind of guide what I wanna do from here? Understanding that these things change over time for many of us, but ultimately it's a place to start and a framework to use. So if a student might identify, let's say like balance as their top value, um, that's gonna shape how they choose their classes or their activities or their social circles for a, a year, right? If they identify that they really care about service, okay, then we're opening up a conversation about integrating service into their lives and, and how they can you know, practice service more intentionally. Um, it's just kind of like a landing spot and a home base to always come back to when these big decisions or uncomfortable things are, you know, are, are happening. Um, and I always, I, I kind of smile going through this with students because I often think like, dang, if only I did this when I was 16, 17, 18, or even 21 or 25, right? It, it changes so much to be able to put words, very specific words to the things um, that we care about, you know, and it becomes um, a sort of um, framework then when a student begins the college admissions process, right? If this kind of beacon is in place before those college admission conversations even start, they're getting so far ahead of um, the process, not only in terms of time, but ahead of a lot of potential stress and strife later in high school when they're starting to say, okay, what kind of path ahead of me is going to meet me in my, my values, right? Um, so I think on that note, I'll take the opportunity to, to pass along to, to Allison here to talk about um, what we do with that kind of foundational work when it comes to college admission. Wonderful. Thank you, Andrea. And thank you, Sheila. Um, I love the little image on this slide because we do see it in three steps. And what you want, of course, is a, a student in their personal growth to, yes, start emerging, start flourishing, and ultimately, you know, reaching for the sky, whatever their personal goal and sky may be in that phase. So, Sheila, you can go ahead and uh, move on to the next slide where we can actually talk about these three phases. So ninth and 10th grade for a Pathfinder student is really about building candidacy. What do we mean by that? This is not a hard and heavy college admission stage. This is more about doing what Andrea talked about, identifying those personal values, identifying ways in which you wanna grow, and then taking steps to follow those values, those passions, those things you want to explore. Building that academic foundation while still leaving room for exploration. Practicing executive functioning skills, social emotional skills to make sure you have that resilience built in because it is something that practicing makes those things much easier. And we're here to give the tips and the tricks and the suggestions to make that happen. Having the confidence to build a relationship with a teacher, maybe try a new extracurricular activity. What are you doing with the time during the summer? We're not here to say that every minute of every day has to be packed with some type of activity or something that's gonna build a resume. We know that students need time to decompress. They need time to think about what's going on in their lives and ways that they'd like to you know, try new things. So this isn't about packing the schedule. Instead, it's about making good decisions and productive decisions with the time that you have in ways that you want to grow and ways that you want to explore. And of course, you know, resources for standardized testing strategies, things like that towards the end of 10th grade. But where my role really picks up is in the second and third stage, right? Preparing to apply in 11th grade, and then of course, 11th grade into 12th grade in the fall semester actually 
writing the applications. Um, so you can see 11th grade in the preparation process is a lot about exploring. It's a lot about self-reflection what you've identified these values and these things that are priorities for you. How are we gonna find colleges that match those for you where we can find that fit? Often students come to me you know, with a list of colleges that came from somewhere else. It came from maybe well-intentioned family members. It came from friends or it came from you know, a ranking on a website or sometimes even a TikTok video. <laughs> Um, we all, you know, get information from different places, but this is the time to say to the student then in the 11th and leading into 12th grade, okay, but what do you want and how can I, as one of your resources, find schools that may be a really great fit for what you're looking for, regardless of where they fell on this TikTok rank list or something like that. It's about you. You can go to a highly ranked college and have a miserable time. You can go to a college that maybe your neighbors never heard of and have the most amazing experience that just propels you for all types of success in your future. So it's about that exploration, careful planning, application strategy, all of those things. And now, of course, when I'm working with seniors, we're actually filling out the application, right? We're taking all the steps, but I really agree with that metaphor of putting the student at the front of the canoe. I say to my students all the time, in the end, it's not me who's going to college and it's not your mom who's going to college, it's you. So I'm here to empower you, to get you to take the lead in this process, but at the same time, I don't expect you to know how to do this. You've never applied to college before. I've been through this process many times, so I'm here to guide you, but at the same time, empower you to be you know, at the front of that journey. Um, I love the title of this presentation, Don't Force It, because when I look back at my seven years of experience being a college counselor at a very good private independent high school where we really were working as hard as we could to make it an individualized process for each student, at any type of high school, when college counseling really isn't, when the foundation rather, you know, the steps in ninth and 10th grade and even early 11th grade aren't there. By the time that student walked into my office as you know, the end of the junior year into the senior year, it did often feel like I was forcing it, right? I was pushing the big questions. Well, what do you want? Who do you wanna be? What are your priorities? And those questions at that point felt very overwhelming. And we had a timeline because applications were due. So, I love this concept, the signet of don't force it, because if we can start building that candidacy, starting this process earlier in the high school experience, it just makes the actual college search and college admissions process so much more simple because the students have the answers to those questions. They know what they're looking for. They understand a process of exploration and self-discovery, which I think is just yeah, the secret sauce of this whole program. All right, we can go to the next slide. All right, so as Andrea talked about vision and values, we use that as a guide through the college admissions process. We are staying open to exploration. This isn't picking one thing and having to stick with it, um, but we use that exploration to choose classes, extracurriculars. Building relationships with teachers is something that I think has been a struggle for students, particularly since the pandemic, right? Because some of these teachers were just faces on a screen like I am right now. <laughs> and it was harder to build those personal relationships. So that is a key message point I'm saying for students right now is you need to get back into the practice of building those relationships for you know good reason for your own academic life and growth but also from my view to make sure we have really strong letters of recommendation for the college process um i already talked about identifying colleges using those vision and values to find colleges that are really the right fit for you and then we want to help a student articulate their own story their own path and that is so much easier and doesn't feel nearly as overwhelming if they've had practice doing this earlier on in the high school experience. So 
I, I'm a huge fan of the Pathfinder program and I, frankly, it makes my job so much easier. <laughs> so thank you, Andrea and Sheila, for all the work that you do uh, even earlier on, because it really does. It makes, it makes my job fun. And I think it makes it even, dare I say, fun for the students too, as they're writing college essays and putting together applications. Um, I do think it makes it a much lower stress process. Yeah. Thank you, Allison, and thank you, Andrea, both. I like my face hurts from smiling, um, hearing you both talk about, um, you know, the work that you do is it's so clear that your your passion um, for helping students is is um, kind of leaping out of the Zoom box um, and making me making my heart feel very happy. Um, so uh, I want to kind of wrap up before we turn to questions by saying two things, really. One, um, the entire goal of the Pathfinder program or this Pathfinder approach, which we've now shown you how to do, um, or at least parts of it, um, I think we've given you some indication how to do this on your own. Um, it's really to help students learn an approach to um, navigating decisions, challenges, whatever may come up for them in life. And it's sort of using the college process as an object lesson, right? This is the first time most students are going to do something this complex that has so many moving parts, has such high stakes, um, and is going to cause them maybe to move across the country away from their parents, right? The first first glimmer of independence uh, for many students. Um, and so, you know, that's a process everybody's very invested in. And we see it as an opportunity to teach these really valuable skills that will, will serve the student well beyond whatever their college application process looks like. Um, it's about kind of navigating these challenges for their life uh, and giving them a, a set of tools that they can always come back to. And then the second thing I want to say is, um, you know, we talk about starting this process earlier and, and that I want to emphasize that doesn't really mean they have to do anything earlier. They have to think about things earlier. Right. It's not about taking the SAT two years early or visiting colleges early or starting to write their essays three years ahead of time. It's not about any of those things. It's really much more about taking stock of who they are and uh, what they would like their life to look like in the future. And then taking the long view and saying, OK, if this is where I want to go, that's going to help me understand my motivations for doing things today. The things that I'm going to do as a normal high school student, right? Go to my classes, hopefully do well in them, you know, build relationships with teachers, do fun things after school and make friends. Um, so it's really more about um, opening their eyes to this process ahead of time. But it's not about starting to kind of go through the checklist of what college admissions entails um, until when, when that's appropriate. It's, it's about laying the groundwork. Um, that is going to ease that process when they get to it. So with that, I'm going to stop my screen share and just open it up for questions. I want to hear uh, what our audience is curious about. If you want to know more about coaching or admissions or any of those specific things we talked about, uh, or if you have a specific situation that you're trying to navigate right now with, with a student, um, you know, let us know. We want to help. You can uh, come off mute and ask, or you can put it in the chat. Either one is fine. Hi, uh, this is Claire. Um, I had a question for you. Um, what is your perspective about a student who's been um, in a in a very supportive school where um, they had their I guess own version of a Pathfinder program, um, but you know now as they're coming into their senior year, it's you know nonetheless overwhelming, and um, and then there's questioning that they have about well, I thought that I wanted this, but now I think I want this. And, you know, I did all these visits in the spring of, you know, my junior year. And how do I know, like, what's, like, what am I discerning that is, like, my true feeling versus my impression? Um, 
what advice do you have like for that student um, with the additional caveat that there's seems to be a lot of pressure at the school about applying ED as the pathway of certainty? That's a great question, Claire. And I hear sort of the stress that you're taking on in your own voice um, for, for your child. Um, it's, it's a really hard situation to be in. And I'm gonna let Allison uh, answer this question, but I am gonna throw in my two cents. Um, there, there feels like, I think for a lot of teenagers, there feels like uh, there's an expectation for them to know their lives in great detail at this, you know, ripe, ripe old age of 17 or 18, which is just impossible, right? Which is why I was sort of sharing my story and saying how we should all share our stories of how things change, right? I was looking at the statistic the other day, American college students change their major on average three times in college. Um, and, you know, I don't know what the statistic is, but I'm sure people change their career paths um, almost as often. So it, it doesn't, it feels like they have to know so they can sell a story to a college, but they don't actually have to know. And colleges are actually quite understanding and supportive of that. Um, but with that, I'm going to let Allison take this one. All right. Yeah, I, I hear this from families, right? Because it feels like a race almost. And the person who applies early and gets in earlier you know, do you get a gold star? Do you get a better life? None of that is true, but it feels like that. And that feeling is very genuine. And, you know, I've worked at, you know, a school that certainly, you know, the college thing was driven, you know, from the very beginning, that was the expectation, of course, college prep. Um, and it can, it can feel very overwhelming. And the student who's doubting themselves or having second thoughts or just thinking, gosh, why does everybody else have this figured out? And I have no clue. Um, I remember often telling my students, especially like last spring, like everyone's just as scared as you. They just may be hiding it better today because <laughs> they are. Um, everyone's nervous. Everyone doesn't necessarily know exactly what the right path, right path is for them. So part of this process and part of working with students in a very individualized way is, you know, being able to ask them questions and then sometimes reflecting their answers back on them to give them some confidence to say, here's what I hear you saying over and over. Or here's what you seem to come back to time after time. Let's focus on that for a minute, because that seems to be what's really important to you, or that seems to be maybe the opposite, what's really worrying you. So maybe we need to address that. So then you can feel more confident moving forward, finding the correct path for you. Um, early decision, in my opinion, I, I, I guess I haven't formally asked Sheila if she agrees with this, but it has to be a heart and a head decision. It can't just be a head decision. It can't just be, this is the best strategy or I have to have an early application. Your, if your heart isn't with that college, then I don't know that you have a, a good reason to apply early decision in that way. It has to be a combination, the head and the heart together, in my opinion. Um, and of course, you know, we talk with each student individually. Early decision can be a great option for some students. For other students, it's absolutely the wrong choice, and that's fine. Um, but I do certainly understand that there can be a lot of pressure felt, especially from their peers, um, where are you applying early? I wish we could flip that question. Well, why are you applying early or should you apply early? Um, the answer might be yes, but in many cases, the answer may be no. And, you know, I've worked at, you know, a highly selective college admissions office and, you know, still, even with these highly selective colleges, they still typically get more than 50% of their class through regular decision. So, it's not the end all be all if you don't apply early decision, but that's certainly, especially this time of year is what tends to get people really, really ramped up. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, for the record, Allison, I do agree with you. Heart and head. Oh, Absolutely. Because yes, we see that acceptance rates are higher in ED and EA, but what does that serve you if that's not a college you 
are going to thrive at, uh, or you're going to be happy at, like you're locked in. Um, and I do know you can get out, but usually not without some like hefty legal fees or, you know, burning some, some bridges. I don't think you want to do that. Right. Right. Um, good. But great question. Ilana, I saw you, uh, raise your hand a little bit. Um, yeah, thanks. I am. Um... So I'm just wondering what you would say, and I'm sorry, I missed part of this presentation because we all had dinner, but so you might have talked about this, but like my son has definitely prioritized quality of life and like a balanced life over, you know, checking a bunch of boxes. I mean, he's responsible, whatever, but he hasn't like filled out a resume, you know, like done a bunch of clubs, this thing, you know, it's been COVID for half his college, you know, high school experience. And um, so like, he's just stayed mentally healthy. And, um, and he's a very smart kid, and he gets straight A's. Um, but, you know, like, and he'll do fine at whatever college he goes to, I have complete confidence in that. Um, I think he's feeling a little deflated by the fact of like, oh God, you have to like do this and that and do, you know, all these things to get into a decent school. And, um, and he's a white Jewish boy from, you know, near Boston. So that's like a bunch of strikes against him. So like any, um, advice you have to like, give him some hope. Allison, I'll let you take it. <laughs> Goodness, yes. I mean, prioritizing balance is actually huge and a skill that not all people are very good at, um, particularly sometimes teenagers who are getting all A's in their classes. You know, um, I think hopefully, if this is a word of comfort, is that that balance, those values, those choices can come across positively in the college application because it, again, it's not a system where we're trying to compete against another person. It may feel like that, but really when I'm helping a student put together an application, it's about communicating who they are, you know, sharing that narrative, showing that self-awareness, showing that maturity, showing, highlighting their strengths. Um, and colleges understand that they're looking for a balanced community of individuals and individuals are, you know, what you look, what, what you choose to do, what you like to do more and more, especially in the pandemic and, um, you know, different circumstances, colleges, and you see it in their supplemental essay questions, it seems more and more, they're really looking for building a community where there is a sense of belonging where people are bringing their life experience and their set of values, their background, all of those things into this college community and being willing to share that of themselves and being open to the sharing of others. So I love your attitude in that you're like, I know he's going to do fine wherever he is. And it feels overwhelming. Like, oh my gosh, some people have done all these things. They already have a resume. Do you need a resume? No. Can it sometimes make it easier to fill out the activity section of the Common App if you have a document to already look at? Sure. But can you do it organically? Of course you can. These are still teenagers and we're not trying to fast forward them to 40 year olds on their you know, fifth job interviewing for an executive position. They are still teenagers and that's what colleges are looking for. They're looking for a bunch of teenagers to join their college community. Um, so I don't know. I think there's real value in that. And it shouldn't be downplayed, um, certainly, uh, especially when the academic piece is there as well. Because, you know, ultimately, it's a learning community. That's what colleges want. Students are going to come there to learn and, you know, focus on academics. But at the same time, that community aspect, I think, has been growing in importance for college admissions officers, offices um, since the pandemic, just because we know that that's been a real struggle in high schools and on college campuses as well. So um, don't despair. There's, there's genuine realness inside there, inside that teenage brain, inside that teenage body. And that's what we've got to communicate in the admissions process. And fortunately, that's exactly what colleges are looking for.
for. They're not looking for me. <laughs> they're not looking for Sheila. They're not looking for Andrea. <laughs> they're looking for teenagers. Um, and that's, we want to put forth, you know, of course, a well-presented uh, version of that teenager, but we also want them to be authentically themselves too. Right. I will also add, you mentioned, you know, some demographic markers that you felt like were strikes against you. Um, while, you know, that may um, put him in a category of, you know, a broad category of other applicants, right? The, the similar qualities. Um, I think we, we often fall into that trap of like, oh, my student is like all these people in other ways. And that's a problem. But um, I encourage you to think about, you know, that realness, like he's, he's different in some way. Like every kid is different. Even your own children, if you have multiple are totally different. Right. Um, and that's really what you need to let shine. Like how, how is he different? How does that show up? How does that make him an asset to a community? Um, and that's, that's where the hope is and him being himself. Um, we have a question in the chat that I think I want to throw to Andrea, um, but I'll do some reframing. Um, so Jeet is uh, describing his daughter, who's in the top 3% of her class, uh, very focused in computer science without a specific uh, interest in a sub-branch of that. Um, and uh, it sounds like they're going along with this because there are a lot of career opportunities that could come out of it. Um, but uh, Jeet has some concerns about his, uh, the daughter's abilities compared to other kids in uh, similar activities. And uh, we're looking for some advice on, I think, how to differentiate, even if um, whatever the measure of skill is, is not quite as high as, as other people. And I think this is where a coach could really add some value. Yeah, I think um, the first place my mind goes when, when hearing about this um, is the title of this presentation being, don't force it. Right. One thing that I talk about a lot with students is like, have a plan, have an idea about what you want, but hold it lightly. I love saying that to people, right? Hold your plans lightly and understand why you're holding them in the first place, right? If students start feeling like they've been narrowed into one particular thing to focus on or been convinced by people in their lives like this is what they should do um, it can lead to not as strong of results because they haven't understood deeply why they want to do it why they want to put extra time in what they're getting out of it and like what really makes them come alive about this particular thing that they're dealing with right so i talk to my parents a lot about like yes, your student has a talent, and yes, this would be an awesome talent to foster, and this could be a wonderful career for them. Um, but we need to let them step back and understand why it's happening in the first place and not get so hyper-focused on the details of their scores or their skill in this particular, you know, language or whatever that we lose sight of the big picture because i i think in what allison just said is like that is such a big part of what colleges are looking at is seeing the person and their enthusiasm for what they're applying for and what they really want to do with it and what they would bring to a college campus because ultimately students are bringing a lot more to a college campus than being the top person in their computer science club right if we put a student who's, you know, maybe as good as half the students in her computer science club, but is passionate and excited and has ideas and dreams and that can come across in their application, that person might be a lot more likely to get into a given school than a kid that just kind of has a blanket talent and has ended up at the top of this, this club, right? Um, so that's not a very direct answer about computer science because I don't know anything about it, but it's that concept, right? hold it lightly, don't force it, and let the student have enough room to develop a, a wonderful and shining uh, enthusiasm for what they want to do, because that's more important than most other things when it comes to this process. I think that answers the question as best as I yeah, can. Yeah, no, and that's such a great example that you gave, because um, it's, it's often not what they do, but how they speak about what they do and, and their vision for what this looks like in their life or in society, uh, that is gonna make the difference in the college application. It's not, you know, 20 points on the SAT or, you know, 
another award for winning a cybersecurity competition. You know, it's really about what do they want to do with that talent that they have. Um, so I think that could probably the, be the thing that moves the needle the most uh, for her, Jean, if you can get her to engage in that kind of reflection. Uh, we have time for maybe one or two more questions. Uh, I got a question from Jenny Kim, hand raised. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Great. Um, so I have just maybe a younger child. So my daughter's going to be a sophomore. And I'm just curious about Pathfinder. Um, I know it's not adding on an exam or another activity, but how involved is it and how frequent do you meet? And is it, um, do you, when's the optimal time to start? Fantastic questions. I think Andrea is really our Pathfinder expert. So I'm going to have her take this one too. Sure. Um, so ideally, we want to start before college admission starts, right? So um, sophomore year, freshman year, kind of the great time to start building those these foundational skills that I talked about, right? Um, it ends up, as far as like time commitment and what actually happens, it ends up looking slightly different for every student, depending on what their goals are, what else is going on in their life, how much you know, they want to accomplish at a given time. And it kind of shifts and changes over the years too, right? I think um, in that freshman and sophomore year, maybe they're meeting a coach once a week for 45 minutes, or maybe they're meeting them every other week, or they're, you know, um, maybe starting to meet with a tutor to help them in academics or in test prep. Um, and then as, we get into the college applications years, junior and senior year. Um, there are more concentrated times with the admissions consultant like Allison around, you know, the deadlines and the plan and, and something gets put in place. But um, as with everything we do, it's very customized to what that particular student wants to do. Um, and that's what I mean by like, we're not throwing the kids on a conveyor belt of services. We're saying, here are all the things available. Let's learn what you want to accomplish, what we're going to do together, and plan it out according, accordingly in a way that feels good for everybody. Um, I, I think that captured all the parts of your question. Yes, thank you very much. I think we have time for one more. Anybody else? Okay, well, it looks like we don't have any other questions. I am going to follow up uh, likely tomorrow afternoon with a recording and uh, a free gift. I'm getting, giving everyone who RSVP'd a free half an hour with Allison to talk about uh, whatever your specific concerns are for your student. Um, so look out for an email from me tomorrow with a link to schedule that. Um, and uh, I really hope that you um, learned something tonight and found some hope. <laughs> um, and uh, I, again, thank you for giving us your time this evening. We really enjoyed talking with you. Bye, everybody.